So now we are beginning the second half of chapter 11. And as I've already reviewed, there are there is an overall sensory and movement pattern. Information comes in to the receptors and it travels up into the thalamus, into the primary sensory cortex, secondary sensory cortex, and the association cortex. Movement uses a similar pattern, but it quite obviously travels a different direction because you plan to make a movement and then you execute it. So it begins at the association cortex, then to the secondary and then primary, and then to the brainstem motor nuclei, and then to the muscles. The somatosensory information follows the same path as the other sensory information, vision, auditory. Uh, you have your somatosensory receptors, which can be kind of touch, pain, stuff like that. We'll be talking about that more. Into the thalamus, and then into the primary sensory cortex, secondary sensory cortex, and then finally into the association cortex. Now, if you remember, information that is afferent comes into the body, sensory information. It is going to be at a receptor over here in a hand, foot, where it's going to travel in, and then it's going to have a uh, synapse here in this dorsal root. This is basically a relay spot and it travels into the spinal cord and here then we have here we have efferent exiting information, movement information that leaves and uh, both the sensory information travels up the spinal cord and the movement information travels down the spinal cord. And so in this way, if you damage the spinal cord, then you're going to prevent sensory information from traveling up, and you're also going to prevent motor information from traveling down. Another important factor about organization within the brain is how our neurons are grouped together. So one of the things that you might learn more about in upper level courses such as cognitive neuroscience or even if you take uh, biology or neuroscience classes in graduate school is that the neocortex is separated into layers and the neocortex is all of this this cortical areas here where you have all of these these folds the gyri and the sulci and the neocortex also is basically the same thing as the cerebrum the forebrain uh, when you refer to cortex, then generally you are referring to sort of this outer cortex, which is known also as neocortex. And this cortex has layers. This also, these layers we talked about briefly in the developmental chapter when we talked about neurons migrating up, okay? So they're going to be migrating to their various places within the neocortex, the layers of the neocortex. So if you look here, uh, layer four, uh, is relatively thick in the sensory cortex, which is right here. And this is, again, the information that is incoming. But then layer four is relatively thin in the motor cortex. Uh, then if you look at layer five for information that is exiting, this is relatively thick, lots of uh, neuron density. And, and then here in layer five in the somatosensory, it's really relatively thin. And you can see here these sort of layers actually represented. These, these sort of the shading differences are also reflected if you were to take a cross section and you would be able to see how the different cell bodies actually sort of spread themselves out. So these layers are actually visible from looking at the brain post mortem. Layer one, two, three, four, five, and six. This is the somatosensory cortex uh, right here. And this is the motor cortex right here. The motor cortex is in the frontal lobes, and the somatosensory cortex is in the parietal lobes. They are separated by the central fissure right here, and uh, also known as the central sulcus. And they, despite the fact that this sulcus separates them, they are highly interconnected and ready to communicate with each other. This is some of what we discussed in the last uh, lecture with regards to these feedback loops. So. If you want to make a motor action, the information is the the, plan, the execution plans are going to be here in the motor cortex. They're going to be sent down your spinal cord, and then the various parts of your body, such as moving your fingers, if they touch something, that you're going to confirm then that a movement has been made by the somatosensory cortex. So this fundamental organization 
between motor control and the spinosensory system. This tells us what the body is up to and what's going on in the environment by providing bodily sensations. These bodily sensations include touch, temperature, pain, the position of our body in space, and movement of the joints. This somatosensory information allows us to distinguish between the, what the world does to us and what we do to it. So what the world does to us, if someone else comes up and touches me, then I will have a registration of my sense of touch, but then there will be no corresponding movement. Whereas if I touch myself, then I would expect there to be a relationship between movement and a relationship between uh, the sensation of me touching myself. And our ability to expect how our own movement would affect ourselves is why we can't tickle ourselves. Uh, because our expectation actually will tickle out the, will, will, our expectation will cancel out the, some of the sensations when we actually do touch ourselves. And the somatosensory system, quite obviously as I've been describing, has a closer relationship with movement than the other senses do. So again, the sensation travels from receptors to the thalamus up to the uh, primary secondary cortices. And there are different types of receptors that we're going to be talking about now in greater depth. And before I talk about these individual receptors, areas with larger numbers of receptors are far more sensitive to stimulation than areas with relatively fewer receptors. So this is going to be your hands and your mouth, your lips, your tongue. There are, there's a huge number of receptors in these areas to give you greater sensitivity. And because you have more receptors in these areas, you're also going to have more nerves that, ner neurons that process this, and so you're going to have a greater representation of these areas within the brain. And we have a sensitivity to different types of somatosensory stimuli as a function of the different types of receptors that we have. So here are the three types of overall receptors. We have nociception, which is the perception of pain, temperature, and itch. And this is free nerve endings that are activated by chemicals. And then we have hapsis, which is perceiving fine touch and pressure. And this identifies objects that we touch and grasp. And this is activated by mechanical stimulation of hair tissue and capsule. And then we have proprioception, and proprioception is perception of the location and movement of the body, and this is sensitive to stretch of the muscles and tendons in the movements of joints. All right, here we have nociception, pain, temperature, and itch. And these are free nerve endings that are here, and they have nerve endings for pain, and they have nerve endings for temperature. So the pain would detect sort of sharp and dull pain, and the nerve endings for temperature would, of course, uh, would of course be sensitive to excessive heat or excessive cold. And damage or irritation to the dendrite or to the surrounding cells on the skin. So if you were to give, if this were to be sliced, cut, damaged somehow, or if there were to be um, very cold or very hot temperatures here, then this damage or irritation is going to uh, cause the release of chemicals that stimulate these nociception receptors to produce action potentials. And then we have hapsis, uh, which is fine touch and pressure. And we have a couple of different types of receptors in here. We have uh, Meissner's corpuscle, um, Passanian corpuscle, Ruffini corpuscle, and this corresponds to touch, flutter, and vibration. And then we also have Merkel's receptor, which would be a sort of a, a, steady, st skin, a steady skin indentation. And then you also have hair receptors, which would uh, respond to flutter or steady skin indentation. And the adaptation of these is rapid and slow. So you have these ones that respond very rapidly and these receptors that respond very slowly. And the fact that you have a combination of rapid and slow is very, very important because this will tell you certain things about when immediately it happens but then there's also times where you have prolonged pressure on your skin that can cause uh, challenges or problems. Some common examples that occur in medicine would be if someone has um, 
they've been lying too much and they can develop bed sores. Uh, you can also, if uh, your pants get too tight, then you can have that prolonged indentation on your skin so that you take them off or any, any clothing that gets too tight, shoes for example. This is also something that is frequently occurs in some of the animal welfare shows where they rescue dogs and the dogs have collars and the dogs have a collar on since they were a puppy and the collar is much too small and as the dog grows then the collar actually becomes sort of slowly indented into their skin to the point where it can cause damage. So we have different receptors that respond to rapid changes and we also have receptors that respond to the slow changes over time. Uh, if, if we were to take, if you had a piece of clothing that was too tight, uh, then you would feel that tightness basically when you put it on and you would probably feel a little bit of tightness during throughout the day, but you would, and then you would feel it again when you take it off because of the combination of this, how quickly the receptors uh, respond, some of them responding very quickly and some of them responding or adapting more slowly, then you would be able to capture the more range of the types of effects that uh, touching can have on your skin. And then we have proprioception. Overall is body awareness. These, uh, these are all rapid responses. Movement uh, stretch the receptors to mechanically stimulate the dendrites within them to produce action potentials. So you have receptors here in your muscles and tendons and joints that when you move then the moving and the stretching activates the action potentials and it sends this information to your brain. Proprioception is highly important for balance and for any sort of physical activity and if it's also the type of thing where you can know where all of your body is in space without looking at it. So you know how you're sitting, you know your posture, you know where your arms are, you know where your legs are, even if you don't have any visual information of that. Because all there are receptors and all of the very throughout your body, uh, in the muscles, the joints, and tendons that send information to the brain about their position. So finally, I'd like to point out that of these three receptors, the pain, the nociception, these release chemicals that stimulate the dendrite. So these are a little bit slower, the, the release of chemicals. Um, then you have mechanical stimulation, which is hapsis, uh, so the touch and pressure. So these, we have some that are rapid and we have some that are slow, but they are all have a mechanical route towards action potential. And then we also have um, mechanically stimulated action potentials through proprioception as well. And so as I began to delve into, it's really important that we have both rapidly and slow adapting receptors. The somatosensory information tells us two things about a sensory event, when it occurs and whether it is still occurring. Uh, rapidly adapting receptors, they respond briefly to the beginning and end of a stimulus. So they would not necessarily keep firing during sort of the prolonged element that, during the prolonged time that something is touching you. So they're going to be primarily tuned to notice change, when something starts and when something ends. The slow adapting receptor, on the other hand, this responds as long as a sensory stimulus is on the body. So it's helpful, really helpful, to have both because then you know about the beginning, you know about the end, and then you know about everything in between. And the interplay between these two tells you a lot about a stimulus.